Welcome to this pre-recorded lecture for PSC 2021 conference. Let me start by first thanking the organizers, Professor Yamashita and Professor Kano for inviting me to give this lecture. Also, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors who contributed to preparing the manuscript with me and also in preparing this presentation. At the start, I would also like to acknowledge the contributions to process systems engineering uh, of my peers, my colleagues, my friends, my former students uh, whose work we have cited in the paper. And also we will, uh, we will um, use, uh, recognize their contributions in this uh, presentation. So let me start that uh, we have arranged the contents in six parts. The first two parts are challenges and role and opportunities of PSC uh, community. Parts three and four deal with methods and tools and their de further development and application. Parts five and six deal with perspectives and conclusions. So what are the challenges? The first one is how to satisfy the needs. As we know on earth, we have a lot of resources, but unfortunately those resources are not uniformly distributed. And at the same time for our own sustainability on earth, we need to convert these resources to the products uh, that we need for our uh, survival. So the challenge here is how to select the products we need how to identify the raw materials that can be used, how to find the process that can manufacture the product in a sustainable manner, and many more. The next challenge is what we call actions have consequences and our decisions on which product we need, which resources we use, which processes we operate have some consequences. For example, the water, the energy, the food, environment, health on earth, uh, will be affected. And this is shown by the Nexus diagram on the left. At the same time, for a growing population uh, in the next 50 years, the global GWP will need to increase. That will require uh, increase in production capacity for most commodities, which will require more energy, more electricity, more water, and will result in increased greenhouse gas emissions. So the challenge is how to address the interactions of energy, water, environment, health, and food for a growing population. The next challenge <clears throat> deals with uh, the chemical, biochemical, and related disciplines. What we need to do is to provide the means to flatten the curve. And what do we mean by this curve is that uh, on the y-axis, uh, it's plotted uh, an effect. For example, the number of infections uh, due to COVID-19 or deaths due to COVID-19. We already know these things very well, but it could also be the amount of CO2 emission. It could also be the increase in temperature, the global warming and so on. If it is business as usual, it is the gray curve. The dashed line, horizontal dashed line is Earth's capacity to endure a corresponding effect. And what we need to do is to flatten the curve so that it goes below the horizontal curve and becomes the green curve. The means to flatten this curve could be increased pro process efficiency, decarbonization, circular economy, and many more. And the improvement can be looked at or measured in terms of the 17 sustainable development goals. At least one or more of these need to be satisfied at the same time. So these are the three challenges. And we have seen that these are complex, difficult challenges. So what is the role and opportunities for PSC? And at the same time, we have the opportunity to manage this complexity. Let's first look at the contribution 
related to decarbonization effect. Since decarbonization means different things to different people, we'll first define what we mean. Decarbonization can be measured in terms of CO2 released versus resources used, temperature increase, and many more. These are direct measurements. Indirect could be effects on climate, availability of resources, uses and needs of products, the de sustainable development goals, and many more. How do we measure these? We, or how do we achieve these measures? Uh, we reduce CO2 emission by reducing energy demand. We utilize captured CO2, generate only the amount of CO2 that can be captured and utilized. Look for integrated solutions, taking into account regional uh, constraints and many more. How do we, what are the means to achieve this uh, targets. That's where process systems engineering comes in. Uh, we provide uh, integration of ideas, concepts to develop significantly better technologies. Uh, there can be use of new conversion and separation technologies. It could be develop and use methods and tools that give significantly better solutions and many more. So what we can see is that PAC does have a role and uh, provides the means to achieve the targets. Already a target has been proposed by IPCC in their special report. If we want to keep the temperature increase to within 1.5 degrees Celsius during the period 2021 to 2050, we need to capture, utilize, sequestrate and so on, 754.09 gigatons of CO2. Out of this, 32% has to be done through industry and the remaining are given there. So we have a target and we have the means. Let's look at the contribution to achieving circular economy and or sustainability. Circular economy and sustainability also means different things to different people. So let's define it first. Uh, these goals of um, uh, circular economy and sustainability could be measured in terms of resources, in terms of services, in terms of products. And again, how do we uh, achieve them? Replace specific resource, service, or product before they become redundant or unavailable. Also, increase the time horizon of availability of all these. And there could be many more. And again, what are the means for uh, achieving these targets? PSC methods and techniques, unification of methods and tools, integration of advances in engineering and science, and also the core PSC topics, which I will discuss soon. And here, instead of giving some targets, I'm giving some topics for research that will help us to develop the means that we need. And the research could be focused on resources recovery, reuse, modeling, advances in computing, numerical solvers, simultaneous design of material and process, intelligent systems for application in healthcare, manufacturing, forecasting, and many more. One area that Normally, we don't see that much discussed, but it's equally important. It is less to do with energy, but more to do with toxicity or pollution uh, in all kinds. So we need to contribute to prevention of human-made disaster. And why is that important? Because almost 95% of all our manufactured goods rely on some form of industrial chemical processes. Nearly half a million, actually this should be more close to 1 million, chemical substances have been registered and many are in industrial use, but only a very, very small fraction uh, of chemicals have measured data. So what it means is that we are using chemicals in our processes and products without knowing what 
good or bad effects they may have, except for the specific function they're selected for. This needs to be prevented. That is uh, any um, disa future disaster need to be prevented and we should be looking for prevention rather than curing the problem um, after it has occurred. So that's uh, an opportunity also for the PSC community. The next one is related to healthcare, PSC methods and tools, as you can see from the cited papers, um, are already helping to develop pharmacokinetic models for drug uh, dosage with respect to uh, within, within the human organs, um, design of uh, clinical treatment protocols uh, for different diseases, um, liver function or other human uh, organ function as an engineering system, and also vaccine allocation and effect forecasting, for example, in a pandemic. So these are already being done. And what can we do further in, in the healthcare area? So in order to understand whether process systems engineering as a discipline would be able to uh, tackle the challenges, uh, we can try to evaluate this through a multi-layered view of process systems engineering. To understand this view, uh, one has to look uh, in two directions. One is from left to right, horizontal. That reflects what is the main activity. And from bottom to top, how with the knowledge uh, that is currently available, how to achieve this target. So let's see that one of the main activities uh, of uh, engineers, including process systems engineers, uh, engineering is to convert the resources to the products that we need through a process. And the knowledge that we have, uh, this knowledge we need to apply to design, operate, analyze, control the process. So from bottom to top, we apply our knowledge from left to right. We convert the resources to products that we need. And then this is the core fundamental layer. And we could ask, is that enough? What I would say is that that is not enough because the resources have uh, demand constraints, availability constraints. We would like improved products. We would like less waste. And in order to do this, we need to augment our fundamental knowledge with advances in engineering and science so that we can achieve sustainable, efficient, reliable technologies. And this is the middle advancing layer. And then we could ask, are we satisfied with this? And I would say no, based on the challenges that we have currently, we need sustainable de development of society. For that, we need to augment our knowledge with ideas, disciplines, data sources, integration, together with all the previous knowledge. And if we do that, then we can handle the location dependence, type dependence, demand, availability, recovery of resources to get the products, the optimal products, the lowest waste, control environmental impact, safe operation, and so on. And that will give us the ultimate goal of achieving or going towards circular economy and sustainable development. So with this as the background, we can see that process systems engineering is well placed to tackle the challenges that we are facing. So, in part three, we are going to talk about the core PSC methods and tools that we can apply to, to tackle the challenges. But first, we also need to understand the system and its problems. So let's look at uh, uh, how we solve the problems. Uh, as engineers, 
we are solving the problems and we are solving in process systems engineering, we are solving the problems through a systems approach. So whatever the problem is, we try to uh, solve uh, in, a, in a general sense through the following four steps. First, we uh, understand and then represent the system, for example, mathematically. Then understanding the system, we try to understand the problem within the system and we formulate the problem. Also mathematically, for example. And then once we have formulated the problem, we need to find a solution strategy and we need numerical solvers if we are solving a mathematical problem like that. And then once we have solved the problem, it's not finished. We need to verify, we need to analyze. And what we will see is that with the challenges that we have, it's not just any solution we want, we want significantly better solution. So we can also set up targets for improvement. So if we have this uh, four steps, then let us look at a general mathematical problem formulation and the solution aspects. So that's uh, with these equations, we can say that we can formulate uh, almost any kind of problem that we want to solve. And why is that? Because let's assume that equations two, three, four are related to the model of the system. And equations five, six, seven are additional constraints that we need to add to the problem formulation in order to tackle the kind of specific problems that we will solve. So equations two, three, four represent the model. Equations five, six, seven represent additional operational or other constraints that we want to add to the problem. If we want to find an optimal solution, we need the objective function, which is equation one. So the seven equations doesn't have to be all used in any problem, but it could also be that these seven equations could be as simple as uh, just seven equations, linear, and we can find analytical solutions for it. There could be some problems for which this would be valid. At the same time, for other problem, it could be seven million equations, uh, multi-scale and uh, uh, containing different types of equations and highly complex. But whichever the problem is, we need a solution strategy and a numerical solver to be able to solve it. So that's where the solution strategy and the numerical solver is needed. So what we see also is that if we are able to formulate the problem, we also need to be able to solve it and we need to formulate a very wide range of problems uh, in order to face the, tackle the challenges that we have. And since modeling is at the core of everything, let's look at the modeling a little bit more. There can be different types of model. It can be data-driven, mechanistic, gray box, machine learning, AI-based models, slump parameter, distributed parameter, predictive, multi-scale hybrid, many more. On the left, you see under modeling tools, some tools that uh, I've highlighted, they're not uh, ordered in any importance. The first one is representing the system. Do we represent with equations, symbols, etc.? What are the guiding principles? For example, conservation principles. Uh, most of the models I've come across usually have parameters. And if parameters are there, we need data. And if data is there, this question of stochastic or uncertainty, et cetera. Then before we solve the problem, we need to analyze the model, and then we need to choose an appropriate solver to solve the equations and many more. Now, if all these tools, we put them into a computer-aided system, then we have a computer-aided modeling system. And there, the modeling steps or the workflow for a modeling um, uh, project are highlighted. And in this uh, workflow, 
what we are highlighting also is which of those tasks the human can do very well and which are the tasks the computer can do very well. And if we have a good combination of the tasks done by human and computer, we can significantly reduce the time and efficiency for developing a model. Once we have a model, we can export the model to other systems and solve whatever problem we want to solve. We can put them in a library for reuse. We can also take the model and develop model-based systems for synthesis, design, control, analysis, and many more. And then we can take these individual tools and combine them to form integrated systems. So now let's say that we have a system for which we have a model. And if we know all the um, variables that are coming in, for example, material and energy flow and information flow, then through a model, we should be able to calculate what we need. And the model, as far as I'm concerned, for the models that I'm working with, usually they have balance equation because they are based on conservation principles. Then there are constitutive relations because of thermodynamics, reactions, and so on. Then there are conditional equations like equilibrium or control, and there are defined correlations. And then we could divide the system into subsystems and have models for each subsystem and aggregate them to form the total system model, or we can um, solve each of the subsystems separately, depending on the problem we want to solve. Now, if we have, if we have all the parameters and the, all the input information <clears throat> as shown in the figure, we can calculate what is going out as well as what is inside, depending on the model we are using. And if we can do that, then if you remember from the first challenge, we would like to know what material to use. Well, we can calculate that. We can identify the material. We can identify how much which product to make, again, which product to make and how much, which utilities to use and how much, how many processing steps will be there and so on. And the last one is important because if we also know what is coming out and what is going in, we can also calculate the environmental impacts. Now with this uh, information, let's see one of the most well-known and common uh, result from process systems engineering community. It is a process simulator, which you see on the left with uh, its main components. And on the right is a process flow sheet. So if we have a process flow sheet and a process simulator, and if we have all the needed information, we can do a simulation. So process simulation, given a flow sheet, its models and its design, we can perform the simulation. If we have a working simulation, we can do optimization and control. We can also do process integration and we can analyze in terms of cost, sustainability, life cycle assessment, and so on. But for this, we need some external tools also. Now, this process simulator is one of the most commonly used tool from process systems engineering. And we could say that at any time on earth, somebody somewhere is probably using a process simulator, including at this time. One question one could ask is, are they solving the problem they need to solve efficiently and reliably? And we will discuss that uh, later. Also, we can see that uh, the process systems engineering research generates continuously a large range of systematic methods and algorithms that are then converted into software tools. And here is a list of uh, some of the tools. They're not organized in any order again, and they're not uh, containing, this list is not a comprehensive list, just a selection. And uh, here the tools are uh, uh, grouped into process simulator, integrated systems, equation solving. And the references for each of them are given in the cited paper uh, from 2021. And there is more optimization solvers, 
modeling tools, and so on. So there's a lot of tools that the process systems engineering has already developed, and we could call them the core methods and tools available to tackle the challenges or uh, solve the problems, uh, the opportunities that uh, we have to tackle the challenges. So now let's see which are the problems we should solve, which are the problems we should not solve, and what are the developments in the methods and tools. So we start with the simulator again. And here I should point out that uh, Mario Eden at Auburn University together with PSC for Speed are working on these topics. So we have the process simulator and then we can see that there, the process simulator to solve the kind of problems we need to solve, we will see that uh, they lack some tools. So for example, if we do not have a process flow sheet, how to synthesize the flow sheet. If we do not have one of the models that we need, how to generate and insert the model. If we have designed a totally new equipment like an intensified operation, how do we put that into the model library of the simulator? If we need new catalyst solvent process fluid, how do we add them <clears throat> to the simulator and many more? So these tools are not there, but we still solve these problems. And how do we solve these problems? Because we make an assumption of the flow sheet or of the solvent or of the model. Uh, that means add a model and we do the simulation and we check the result. If the result is not what we want, we repeat. So this is a trial and error solution, which we are using. The problem is that if we are looking for significantly better solutions or order of magnitude improvements, it is unlikely that a uh, trial and error approach will give it unless accidentally we hit that. So that's why we need a new class of methods and tools where the simulator has its role, but we also need other tools integrated with this. And that could be defining different components. And then depending on the problem we have, we configure those components into a problem specific tool that can solve the problem that we want to solve. Next, we look at a contribution from Zhejiang University, uh, from Xi Chen and his group. They have developed a symbolic computational toolbox. And this toolbox can do process simulation, process optimization, flexibility analysis. But they use symbolic computational methods uh, to do that. And their software, an algorithm has built-in symbolic operations. They provide improved strategies to reduce computational burden. The software tool is web-based with cloud computing options. The references given give more detail on their tool and uh, uh, background theory. So if you're interested, uh, check this out. Next, we look at the definition of the problem that we are trying to solve. If it is business as usual, we make profit at the expense of earth. We could also not only make profit, but also minimize the impact, environmental impact, and we can have a better solution. <clears throat> I should also point out here that when we are talk talking about the environmental impact as shown on the y-axis, if we use a weighted sum, in addition to the weighted sum then, we need to have the individual environmental impacts, uh, the limits on them as constraints. If we do not have those individual as constraints, then we could come to a situation where the same weighted sum, which is a, which could be an acceptable amount, 
uh, from a numerical uh, point of view, but it could kill all the people, but save the earth or destroy the earth and save all the people. So we do not want this kind of solutions. So I would advocate the use of additional constraints in addition to the weighted sum of the environmental impact. Let's look at some of the other developments in the area of optimal process integration. Uh, this work comes from University of Waterloo, uh, the group of Luis Ricardo Sandoval. He's proposing a NMPC applied for simultaneous design and control under uncertainty. Uh, first uh, is a back off approach where uh, they develop and use uh, low order dynamic models that capture the sensitivity of the closed loop system with respect to design and control variables under uncertainty. And the next thing to point out is that mathematical programming with complementarity constraints uh, has been developed, uh, which explicitly solves the simultaneous uh, NMPC based uh, bi level optimization problem by transforming it into a single level optimization problem. More details of this can be found in the cited papers and they have tested it on wastewater treatment plant. <clears throat> they have also done other integration like optimal design and uh, dynamic operation of intensified systems like reactive distillation, integration of uh, scheduling and online control of multi product systems using NMPC. The next, also in the, uh, in the idea of integrated design and operation, this also is related to decarbonization and the work uh, I'm reporting is from Chung Nam National University uh, from Ko San Ro and his group. What he's pointing out is the fluctuation nature or fluctuating nature of renewable energy resources, that is energy producing or energy supplying processes uh, based on renewable energy, uh, they have uh, fluctuating resources. <clears throat> and if we want to design and operate uh, processes that require this energy, then we have to uh, do the design operation infrastructure. Uh, and if we need to optimize it, we need to take all this into account. <clears throat> and they have taken this into account and came up with a flexible renewable chemical process where there is the power plant, the energy supply, industrial plants, uh, all are integrated together. More details can be found in the cited references. Next, I want to point out uh, some scientific advances that looked very promising at the start, but it is questionable if they tackle the problem. <clears throat> this, there are many papers on this, including our papers, and I don't mind saying that we probably failed in this. So let's look at it. We first captured the CO2 wherever it is coming from. Then we add hydrogen and uh, combine with the CO2, the synthesis gas, we make methanol and we can also do direct synthesis of methanol. And then with the methanol, we add more CO2 and we make dimethyl ether and we have excess CO2 that is unused. We can also add here dimethyl carbonate, succinic acid, and other products. And then we can look at the table. And if we look at the lowest uh, row, we can see that we can achieve negative carbon emission. And we can also um, make profit from the economic analysis. But what is the problem then? The problem is that the number of carbon atoms that are 
in the CO2 captured stream is much bigger than the number of carbon atoms needed to make the world demand of products like DME, DMC, succinic acid, and so on. So which means that unless we sequestrate uh, the largest part of the captured CO2, we will not make an impact on the global warming. So we need to reformulate this problem. And this reformulation could be this one, uh, where we see with the uh, green parts, this is the energy demanding process where we convert raw materials to the product we need. And then we integrate it uh, with the energy supplying process, which can use renewable as well as non-renewable and whatever CO2 that uh, this process will generate will be captured and used in the energy demanding process. And at the same time, we also integrate the utility system. And so what we want is a totally integrated system. Um, we can, in the concept of symbiosis, so that we have a self-sufficient uh, area that covers the process uh, that re requires energy, the process that supplies energy, the process that um, treats the wastewater, the process that includes the supply of the water. Can this be solved? The cited reference, which is a collaboration work with a group in Tsinghua University, we have solved this as a conceptual problem and more details can be found. Then we move to water supply for a small city. This work is uh, done by the group of Iqbal Mustafa at University of Bradford. What we want is water of different types, drinking, irrigation, livestock, power plant, hospital, and so on. What we want is a desalination, design of a desalination process. So as I pointed out before, we have the general mathematical formulation and objective function, then the model equations uh, given as constraints and additional constraints for the process operability and so on. And if we have this model, we can solve the problem. And here is the solution of the problem, which is the design of the desalination plant, including multiple effect uh, desalin desalination units, thermal vapor compression units, and also reverse osmosis units. And the problem has been solved by converting the mathematical problem uh, and sending it to GPROMS and using its built-in tools to solve it. More details can be found in the cited paper. Next is in the area of bio-based uh, society, the methods and tools needed. On the left, you see a typical crude oil-based uh, refinery that gives us the different products that we need. Can we convert this or can we rather replace this with the integrated biorefinery concept where we take the biomass at different locations and convert it into the products that we need at those locations. This kind of work is done at University of Salamanca by Mariano Martin and his group. And there's a lot of work they have done uh, considering different kinds of biomass, different kinds of products, and different kinds of analysis. All of this can be found in the cited reference or references. Then the next one comes from the University of Tokyo uh, from the group of Hirokazu Sugiyama. What he's showing are the steps of stem cell freezing. He starts with uh, the smallest scale where quantum chemistry and uh, molecular dynamics is used. Then he goes into 
describing the cell damage during free freezing and thawing where hybrid modeling is used. And then after a few steps, he looks at the scale up analysis by uh, CFD tools. And then finally, cost benefit analysis through agent based modeling. What he's showing is that PSC can tackle various challenges at multiple scales for pharma. Then finally, in this section, we have processes, we have improved processes, all these things, but we cannot forget the safety and hazards and risk, all these issues. So this work is being led by Jin Song Zhao at Tsinghua University. And what we can say is that the risk, which you can see the equ a simple functional equation, um, this uh, relationship uh, needs to be identified. And in industry these days, uh, the current state of the art for identifying this risk correlation is using measured data and experience. And because of this, the safety process safety management uh, is unreliable in the sense that different locations will have different experience and different uh, data. And so the outcome would be different. So what is necessary is to use the digital transformation, advances in digital transformation to understand the system. And then for example, to develop uh, uh, process systems management uh, that can uh, give better results. And what you see here is a fault diagnosis system that has been developed by Jin Sung Zhao and his group. And the references will give more details. So now we go into the perspectives. And then the question here is, we can solve all these problems that I've shown in the middle layer. <clears throat> and what about then the final goal of sustainable development? What do we need? Can we solve them from the middle layer or do we need to further advance them? So let's look at this. Let's first uh, go back to the challenges and roles of PSC. The energy, water, environment, health, food nexus is getting more complex in the changing world and an integrated solution approach is necessary to tackle better the interactions among the individual effects. We have already given the target for global warming that needs to be attained. And since 31st of December, the numbers have changed. The number of infections has increased quite a lot. The deaths also, but uh, we are lucky that uh, even though the infections have increased quite a lot, they were not as serious as before. And uh, there was a spike in the numbers in January and February. That's why they're so high. Now, what we also should think of is that all these resources that we have, the use of these resources not only gives us problem with respect to global warming, but can also give us problem with respect to pollution, even though they also help us with our sustainability. Just think of what will happen if more methane or nitrogen oxide or uh, refrigerants get released to the air. The, their global warming potential is significantly higher than carbon dioxide. Also, according to data, uh, already in 2019, 2 million people died just from exposure to hazardous chemicals only. And this was an increase of 29% compared to 2016. So these are problems that we cannot neglect anymore. So then what do we need? We cannot be satisfied with the models that we have. We need to continuously improve the models. I will not go through all the text in here, but the main message is that we need more models of increased scope and significance 
whichever kind of model is needed, we need to develop them and use them so that the problems we can solve can be enlarged, the scope and significance of them or the application range. Because we have new models, we will also require the corresponding numerical solvers. And if we have more than one solver for a problem, we need to have a selection criteria. We need to take into account the advances in computation and advances in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on. If we have the modeling and the solvers together, we need to implement them and use them in algorithms, procedures, workflows for design control, analysis, and so on. So they also need to be developed in the same way. And then if we have all of these, <clears throat> we need to uh, solve uh, integration issues. So we also need integrated tools. And again, we uh, there are examples uh, that are listed. We need to satisfy these. And then finally, if we put them all into computer-aided systems, then we need to ask what will be the application range of models available in model libraries. They must increase. Will it be possible to adopt models, data, algorithms from one application sector to another? Yes, it should be. What will be the status of process simulators? Will they serve as virtual realities for specific applications? Yes, they should. Will computer-aided systems of future provide significantly better products and more sustainable associated processes for their manufacture? Yes, they must. So what I would also point out here is that um, it's not just the co-authors and myself who are all working only on this. The whole PSC community is working in different places, in different items and topics. And we need all of them to contribute for our sustainable development. And then one proposal from University of Twente, from Edwin Zondervan and his group. And he's motivated by the developments in the Formula One racing. In 40 years, the time at a pit stop went from two minutes to a couple of seconds because of standardization or through standardization. And I checked this at the last Formula One, and this is actually true. So we need to remember that all what we are doing, sustainability is core in tomorrow's process industry. So what Edwin is proposing, first the objective, satisfy the need of different tools for different problems at space and time scales. And then his proposal is a PSE superstructure pit stop team that standardizes the use of superstructure models and optimization for individual technologies, plants, and supply chain. What you see in the figure is a simplified version of a superstructure for separation. If there is only one separation type, it's simple and easy. But as the number of separation type increases, the number of alternatives also increases. So uh, PSC superstructure pit stop team can help to find the solution faster, just like the Formula One team did. Then comes the symbiosis. I come back to it again, because this is very important from a decarbonization point of view, sustainable CO2 management, and apply the concept of symbiosis. On the left, we have the capturing of the gas uh, CO2. In the middle part, we have the different capture technologies. And on the right, we have the utilization and we have the sequestration. But as we have seen, this is not enough. We need also to integrate uh, the energy networks uh, with renewable and non-renewable and also water network or other networks and then formulate and find the solution. What we are solving here are networks within networks within networks. So this is a large complex problem. 
and we have the means to solve this. But we need to formulate realistic problems and show that this kind of solutions, which actually will be uh, totally uh, self-sufficient in a region with, uh, with generated power, uh, least uh, need for fresh water, um, products coming out, all of these things uh, could be obtained if we can formulate and solve and using the concept of symbiosis. Now let's look at the pollution kind of problems and uh, to avoid the hazard, this work is done at the PSC for Speed company with the tight in, in Bangkok. So we have uh, to, to explain the steps and the framework. I will just use an example of a product. Let's take a hairspray, a liquid hairspray. So the basic information is that it's a liquid product application. It's a hairspray specifications. We need to know which are the compounds that are in the liquid product. Once we know the chemicals, we can go to a database and find out whether there is some chemical that cannot be accepted for different reasons. And, and then once we identify the chemical, we need to substitute it. We have different algorithms for substitution, the well-known computer-aided molecular design, but we can also combine it with machine learning active artificial intelligence, or we can also look at non-substitutes if we have them. With all of these, we find a substitute. And then if all the requirements are satisfied, then we make a final report together with sustainability, life cycle assessment, safety, cost, and so on. It requires a lot of work, a lot of databases that needs to be continuously increased in size together with uh, uh, design synthesis algorithms. And if anybody is interested to join us, please contact us. Next and the final in this series is the promise of quantum computing. What is the difference between quantum computing and classical computing? It's the, the difference is mainly with what is called the bits. In classical computing, a binary bits of uh, which can handle states like zero one um, uh, can be found in classical computing. In quantum computing, the they are using qubits and they're not constrained by only zero one states, but it can have multiple states. Because of that, quantum computing can handle larger problems requiring larger databases in a more efficient way. And because of that, they can solve the problems faster and more accurately. Uh, this work is done at, also at Technical University of Denmark by Said Mansouri and his group. There's a lot of work already uh, going on in showing the application of quantum computing to solve different problems. And I will not go through them, but uh, look out in the literature uh, to see new developments in this area. So now finally we come to part six and look at the conclusions. What have we learned from history? <clears throat> Let's look at the role of uh, engineers, not just chemical engineers, chemical, biochemical, process systems engineer, engineers and others. We should promote research and development as a fundamental pillar. We should facilitate uh, global dissemination of our knowledge. We should promote conservation and care of global resources, health, safety, environment. We should promote the highest standards and we should prepare for the next pandemic or disaster with methods and tools that can contribute to quick problem resolution. And here is one suggestion or proposal how do we prepare for the next pandemic? Let's assume that for the next pandemic, vaccine or drug that can tackle the pan pandemic that is uh, flattened the curve has been found. 
what we need to do now is to find the distribution system that can help to flatten the curve. So what we need is how to distribute the vaccine or drug and implement it in such a way that the curve would be flattened in the shortest possible time. So the model in this case would be a lumped parameter dynamic model and for different scenarios, which are time dependent. So we would solve dynamic optimization problems. And PSC community has the means to solve this because we know uh, what kind of model is needed. We know what kind of solver is needed. So we should be able to solve it and we should be ready to tackle this problem when it comes. So my suggestion here is that we develop a tool just like a process sim simulator that everybody around the world is using and we provide this tool to the community. And more details can be found in the paper. And also if you're interested, do contact me or my co-authors. So finally, some observations. We have seen that many of the papers do give literature survey, but it's time dependent. And so question is, should survey be uh, time limited? And if yes, is there a danger of reinventing the wheel instead of a better wheel? In the case of surrogates, use of surrogate models, the term has become very popular. What we see in many papers is that the objectives for developing a surrogate are given, which are reasonable and justified. But when we see the results, we see that those are not the conditions where the surrogate is used. So was a surrogate really necessary? Also, we could ask, um, in some cases, the surrogate is developed corresponding to a reference model. But according to a dictionary, a model is a surrogate. So are we talking about surrogate of a real system? Machine learning, some machine learning based models appear to be training machines to recognize concepts that are well known to humans or can be found in textbooks. So are we talking about a future where machine learning based models instead of textbooks would be used to teach fundamental concepts. Public publication uh, quality, uh, without going into details, the question would be for review papers and perspective papers, is it necessary for at least one of the co-authors to have worked on the topic to give their opinion or perspectives? Do they need to be experts on the topic to write these papers? In terms of reference, we have seen sustainability, circular economy, decarbonization, surrogate, etc., seem to mean different things to different people. Is there a need to set up some criteria to justify the use of these terms? Finally, I will just uh, put this slide for something to think about and thank all of you who have listened uh, to my presentation. I hope uh, myself and my co-authors have uh, given you something useful. And if you have any questions, please contact us. Remember that this is a pre-recorded video. The live was given at the conference. Thank you very much. And hopefully you found this interesting.